Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real-world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining the Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, as always, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me Jason Riley out of Austin, Texas with Fairway Asset Management. How are you doing today, Jason? Uh, it's hot as always down here, Lance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were just talking about the heat and the heat in Texas it gets hot. And uh, the whole West is uh, going through a, a heat wave as we record this. So I think it was up over, I think we pushed 95 here in Portland yesterday. So no good. Um, yeah, thank God for air conditioning. That's for sure. Um, so Jason's been a longtime client of ours uh, over on the Veravest side of things. So known Jason for quite some time. Um, and uh, Fairway Asset Management is also a verified gold member of the Veravest Sponsor Network. So uh, and uh, his brother Jeff, who he works with, uh, recently moved up to our neck of the woods. So um, we've got a lot, a lot of connections going on. Uh, today we're going to spend some time just really talking about the power of diversification. You know, I think, you know, in your portfolio at large, obviously, but really, you know, the, the power of diversification in the vehicles that you invest in and how to, I mean, just diversification in general, right? And there's, it's, it, it can be difficult, um, especially in the real estate side at times for people, they, I think it's pretty easy to get over concentrated. Um, you know, even with, you know, the syndications that are available, you know, that's a single asset. And even, even though the minimums have come way down in, in the most recent years, you know, you can still find yourself sort of really limited to just a handful, exposure to a handful of deals, concentration risk uh, on sponsors in particular uh, and geographic regions and, and certain property types. So I think that the cool things that, that, that are the cool stuff that Jason's been doing for, for years now and building portfolios that really give you diversification beyond just you know, obviously the real estate asset class, but building portfolios that investors can allocate capital into that actually have other alt, uh, you know, other types of alts, um, which which we'll kind of get into today. So, um, you know, high level, Jason, why don't you share a little bit with us about how you kind of, you know, saw the light on this particular topic? You know, I know you're pretty passionate about it, but, you know, really sort of when did it hit you that, hey, this diversification thing's a big deal. Um, you know, obviously people talk about it broadly, but just for, for you, especially being in the alt space for so long, it, it's easier said than done to, to build a diversified portfolio of alts. So maybe kind of go back to, you know, way back when you first got started, when you started building these things, kind of how that came about. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, by training, Lance, uh, I, I, I'm actually, uh, I have an economics background and, uh, that was something I was actually really passionate about. Um, uh, when I was both in undergrad and in grad school, and um, you know uh, the uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, professor Harry Markowitz, who was a uh, I believe he was at the University of Chicago for a number of years, um, you know he said uh, he said a quote that you'll find out, out there often, which is that that diversification is the only free lunch in investing, and, and basically you know what he meant by that was that you know it is impossible to control for every risk out there, no matter how well you do your underwriting, no matter how well you do your diligence. So really the only way that you can, you can effectively protect yourself is by having a diversified portfolio. Um, you know, and, and what, what really made, what really made me see the light, I think on that was, was I, I looked at a ton of interesting deals, both on the real estate side uh, and on the alternative investment side. Um, and, you know, and I would see really interesting deals. They would be, they would have great yields. They would, you know, have all these protections built into them. Um, you know, and a lot of them work as, work as advertised and then one wouldn't work as advertised. One would just, it would get, it would get stuck into the mud. It would go through a work through and, and, and a lot of times it wouldn't even be because, you know, you, you did poor underwriting or you did something wrong. It just would be some exogenous factor that came in out of left field and just, you know, sunk a project or just, just yep. made things difficult. So, you know, that as we built our portfolios and as we saw that, you know, I said, let's build out that diversified portfolio for our clients so that we can help them hedge out that risk, um, that especially that unknown risk. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's, it, it's, it's the thing that, it's an interesting thing because I think that everybody, 
sort of goes into it and they're like, oh, no, no, my, perf- my, for- my portfolio is diversified. Yeah, I mean, I've got – I mean, especially on the – the public equity side or the, 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 I guess the more liquid public stuff, right? Like anyone who's managing their money, whether it's the 401k provider or whatever, you know, that's all they talk about is sort of like, well, you know, let's make sure that you have some exposure to this and you've got, you know, the emerging and you've got the international and you've got the, you know, the growth <laughs> funds or whatever. And so everyone's like, yay, I'm diversified. Right. And so, that it, it, it sort of – I think that's where it ends for most people is that's kind of how they think about it. And especially now in the last you know, seven to ten years when you've seen really this groundswell of activity amongst uh, high net worth investors in particular who've realized like, oh my gosh, there's all of these uh, – these, you know, you got Yield Street and you know all these different things that are out there on the internet now that you can, you know, you can invest in, and so they're they're now they're sort of realize like, oh my gosh, this like kids in a candy store sort of I put it right, <laughs> but yeah. but the funny thing is is that, you know, they they then say, well, I'm going to allocate X percent of my wealth to this this sort of stuff, and you know, and and but then they go and you know make some fifty or hundred thousand or you know whatever hundred a bunch of hundred thousand dollar investments and when and it's like it's lost and then they still think they're highly diversified um so maybe for you share a little bit about how you guys look at it because um when, when you look at something you're not usually looking at single asset deals you yourself are looking at other portfolios that have many investments right i mean like right. you're taking it to the nth degree like when you mean diversified you mean diversified I mean, you know, if I would, I would start with the philosophy that I would rather have exposure to ten loans than one loan. I'd rather have exposure to a hundred loans than ten loans. I'd rather have exposure to a thousand loans than a hundred loans. Right? Yep. The 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 more I can increase that diversification, you know, especially if I can if I can start to think about diversifying it geographically, diversifying it by asset category and type, um, the better off I'm going to be when one or more of those if those loans, in case we're talking about loans or assets, gets into trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and really, you know, the thing is, risk can kind of come from everywhere. And I think I think the whole COVID-19 pandemic showed us, you know, here's a black swan risk that, you know, March of last year, on March 1 of last year, nobody really yeah. thought or knew or understood where this risk could come from. And then all of a sudden, you know, whole swaths of the economy are shut down. Whole things yeah. can't happen. You know, ports aren't accepting goods, right? Um, you know, that's just a, you know, and that's a, that's a risk that I don't think anybody could really plan for. Um, and, you know, and I, I think about, I think about other risks that can kind of come out of left field. You know, one of the things that I think, especially on the on the real estate side you, that you're probably seeing right now is that, you know, some of these tariffs that came into effect from the previous uh, administration, mm-hmm. you know, they're actually still in effect. Um, you know, we see that we see that happening in the uh, in the construction industry. We're seeing that in, in the on the lumber side of the house. Right. Where, you know, they physically can't get the sticks to, to build yeah. the houses. Right. Um, and it's you know, and that's a that's an artificial risk. That you know came into play. Um, it could evaporate tomorrow. You know the current administration could could turn around 180 on it, but they also may not. And so you know, to me, I have to be able to control against those sorts of risks, especially the ones that I that I can't see coming. Yeah, and it's, I mean, and like you hit on that. I mean, everyone's the, the real estate thing is obviously we spend the majority of the time talking about, but you know, it it, it still does. I mean, it cycles for the most part in concert with, I mean, obviously you saw the pandemic retail and hospitality, senior living, things like that really get hit hard. Um, but, but, but still they, they do generally, you know, whether it's single family, multifamily retail office, industrial, more or less, they're still going to kind of cycle together. Some will lead, some will lag. Um, and, you know, and, and I've spoken with people that are sort of like 90% of their portfolio is in real estate, you know, or, mm-hmm. or I mean, like basically there, I mean, I talk to guys like that all the time, um, yeah. you know, and so what are the other sorts of things that maybe aren't, you know, I mean, I think one of the things real estate or the private markets in particular is they're non-correlated to the public market, right? So you don't get right. the fluctuations from the whims of hedge funds and, you know, day traders and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, um, but you still do these these asset classes, real estate being, you know, it's sort of recognized as his own at this point. What 
what are the other types of things out, out there? And like, how, how do you figure out whether or not they're, they're, they are correlated like real estate? I'm assuming things like art or litigation finance. I mean, I don't know. Do they have their own sort of ups and downs? And, you know, I, I, like those are the things that I don't even know how one, how do you figure that stuff out? <laughs> Well, you know, we, uh, you know, on that theme of diver- diversification, you know, we take that up to kind of the next level with our overall portfolio, yeah. and we think, okay, well, how does a sector like real estate, how does that balance against something like small business lending? Uh, yeah. How does that balance against specialty finance? We, you, you mentioned art loans. We, we, we've done a program for the last ten years of loans, you know, kind of specialty finance that were collateralized by significant works of art or antiques. Um, really niche sort of uh, thing that the, the high-end banks used to do, but you know they got out of it uh, post uh, post 2008 um, uh, when they just really decided to, to bear up. Um, we we've done other things like uh, litigation finance, like you mentioned, life settlements, which are you know the purchase and holding of life insurance policies to maturity. And you know what we look at is we look at kind of each slice in our portfolio, and we think, okay, well, how is this going to react to say an up or down economy? And then also, how is it going to move in concert with the other things in our portfolio? Um, some things move a little bit in, in step with each other, as, as you might expect. You know, if, if the economy is tanking and real estate's tanking, then also our small business lending yeah. program is going gonna, is gonna to be suffering as well, right? That's kind of the front line of the economy. Um, some sectors uh, move kind of just independent. Uh, the life settlement, uh, life settlement litigation finance sectors, they really just live in their own little universe, um, you know, where they're just kind of protected and they have their own kind of set of laws and and asset protections and they really don't care about what's going on in the in the economy you know for the good or the bad if the if the economy and the market are on a a straight bull run they're still going to kind of be doing their own thing which you know which is fine as well so that's that's the way we think about that portfolio construction you know how does it work with the overall economy and then how do they play with each other I, i like to think that you know if everything in my portfolio is all going up at the same time, then I, I got to be worried. I, I'm doing something wrong, right? Yep. I don't expect everything to be going up all at the same time. At this, at, conversely, when things are, you know, when we have a troubled year like last year, I expect to get some protection out of that portfolio. I expect those pieces that live in isolation to just yeah. ignore things that are going on because of a shutdown economy. Um, we also saw too, you know looking at kind of the covid year there there was a lot of there was a lot of i guess um things that that, that didn't go the way i would have necessarily thought if you asked me on on march of last year mm-hmm. um on the real estate lending side you know we saw kind of construction come to a, a hard halt um you know in march as everybody sort of figured out you know what lockdowns and how to work safely and all that sort of stuff looked like but then it kind of got right back into into business um you know all that stuff was was counted as an essential uh, essential service essential business uh, another thing we saw, especially on the, you know, on the housing side of the, of, of the fence, was that, you know, people who were living in the dense urban centers, you know, in the Northeast, you know, New York City, you know, if New York City is shut down, if Broadway is shut down, if all the restaurants are shut down, all you're doing is you're living in a high price box in the sky and you can't go do anything. So, right. you know, I would talk to people in New York and they would say, I am doing whatever I can to get out of my apartment, out of my condo and go find a, a house with a little backyard somewhere in New Jersey or wherever the heck I can go just so I can I can get some free space. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've saw that drive into that demand as well. So um, any, anyway, that's that's. That's why we built that diversification. And I don't know where some of the risks are going to come from. I don't know where some of the benefits are going to come from. But I do know that if I can build that outright, I'll be ready to weather through them. Yeah. And I think that that's what, you know, going back to it is that the, you know, attempting to construct a portfolio that's diversified in that way on one for on your own is is challenging. Now, if, if you have a net worth that's in sort of the, 30 50 million plus i mean it seems like you you, you probably could but I, I think that 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 still remains one of the big issues right is because for for many of these um the, the securities laws sort of don't really allow i mean real estate being an exception they they do allow more uh, people to participate in those offerings like through the reg d and the mm-hmm. investment company act sort of stuff is the exemptions from registration is are are more favorable but for these other things, I think that that still continues to kind of limit people, which means the minimums are much higher. You know, they can be right. they can be a million dollars in many cases, 
um, which which makes it difficult for someone to gain access to some of those other non uh, real estate types of private placements. Um, you know, so access becomes an issue, and really then. Yeah. Um, you know, which is the thing I'm always trying to, to, to harp on too, is that it's not so much like the love of like to crowdfund things or the democ- the full democratization. And, you know, I'm, I'm not quite, I'm not quite there because I, I think that I see and talk with lots of, um, accredited investors who, uh, the, the securities, uh, regulations assume have some amount of sophistication. And I still feel like my experience is that their, um, knowledge, uh, lags, what I believe is sort of necessary, right, to be what I would consider truly sophisticated, like to actually understand those things. Hence why we do this podcast, right? Because right. I believe that it is attainable. I believe that people can learn. There's no question about that. But but the issue the issue remains, right, is just that, that in order – I want minimums to be lower – to make it easier for, because I believe that a lot of the administrative burden sort of solve problems, which is the stuff we sort of do on the Verivest side of things, just make it to where it's not so burdensome to have a larger number of investors or partners in a deal. <clears throat> but really that still is one of the big, I mean, it's hard to attain or build your own diversified portfolio of these assets because the minimums are 50, 100 plus, And in some cases a million, you know, if we can get them down to, 15 or 10,000, you know, maybe it's more attainable if you've got, you know, a decent net worth to still have a totally, you know, an actual diversified portfolio that has some exposure to the public markets and some exposure to some of these, you know, more like the Yale endowment model, right? Where right. maybe it's more 50 50, you know, stocks and bonds, half stocks, you know, and then the rest is private market stuff. But so f- for you, has that been part of it too? It's just, it's that building relationships to gain access to then portfolios that have enough assets in them to be diversified and then your ability to allocate capital into those to have a total diversified portfolio? Yeah, you know, you bring up a real good point, Lance. You know, the, the, the problem for a lot of folks, you know, if you're if you're someone who has assets and call it like the one to 10 million range, um, you know, especially if you're on the smaller end of that, if you're say one to five million, you, you know, per the SEC regulations, you're a sophisticated investor. You know exactly what you're, you're, you're doing, and you can go do whatever you want, right? Um, but, you know, it, when the rubber meets the road, are you really understanding that, right? You know, if you're, if you're a doctor out there, um, you know, you may be the smartest doctor, and you can go perform brain surgery, but how much time have you spent looking at investments and truly understanding them? You know, same thing if you're an engineer. You can build a factory. You can, you, you, you can understand the ins and outs of it. How much time have you spent on the investment side? What we saw a lot, um, we know with our clients, especially, uh, you know, who were in kind of that range, you know, that one to five million range, one to 10 million range, was that, you know, they had an interest in the alternative space. Uh, They had a need for income um, and they would see some of these interesting, you know, investments out there. But then when they went to go invest, it was like, okay, well, hey, the minimum is half a million, a million. And that's kind of that was their budget for alternatives. So now they have exactly one alternative placement, you know, with one manager uh, or maybe one asset category. And here's hoping that that black swan event or those unforeseen factors don't impact that, right? If that's 20% of that your overall portfolio and it takes a hit, I mean, you know, uh, losing 25, 20% of your portfolio, I mean, that is materially impactful, right? So, you know, one of the benefits of our diversified program was that, you know, we, we were able to allow our clients to invest at a, a much lower minimum that's a lot more suitable for an individual, but they're investing into this giant portfolio that looks and feels like something that, you know, a guy with 30, 40, 50 million dollars would put together, something that a bigger family office would put together. Right. Um, and so and that's, yeah. you know, the, 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 the way I like to think about it is, you know, by doing that portfolio and by bringing that minimum down for those clients, but letting them have all that access, they get to punch above their weight class really is yeah. what's happening. They get to invest like a much larger investor, even though they really aren't. Yeah, I agree. And then, and it should be said, right, like some of these these um, limits I'm speaking of, you know, Jason and others like him, <clears throat> they have to contend with them. And so it's, you know, you really can't have more than 99 beneficial owners in these vehicles. Right. I mean, you, right. you know, because that's just what the rule says. And if if you if you did, you'd have to register as an investment company, which just, you know, it it, it, it sort of unlocks all of this other, you know, regulatory 
madness that you have to kind of contend with. And so I think that that's important for people to understand is that some of those things have been put in place, um, which do limit access. And, you know, and I'm not entirely sure as to, you know, why they did that. I think some of it is they believe it's consumer protection. Kind of what we're talking about is just, you know, kind of a forcing function to make sure that, you know, people aren't going hog wild and just letting anybody into these things. Um, you know, it sort of forces you to have to, you know, deal with people who have the money, right? Because it, it does force a larger minimum. And, uh, right. but I, I tell this with my clients in the real estate side all the time. It's just, I know for them, it, it is more efficient to tilt up a blind pool fund, right? Something that they can go out and get commitments from investors that they can call in. And, you know, it's more of, uh, it, it just, it's just easier, right? I mean, if you've got this pipeline of acquisitions and, you know, just getting commitments and then calling it in and it's easier than, you know, tying up a property and then having to race to raise money for it. Like I totally get it. But the thing that I think most fail to appreciate is sort of this dynamic of, yeah, the second that you, okay, you like having the pooled fund and it does create some diversification for the investors. But what it also does is that you go and you turn around and make your minimum $250,000 or $100,000. I, I think for whatever reason, people don't do the math to say like, just think how wealthy one person would have to be for that to be the appropriate exposure. I know that you're giving them diversified access to eight, 10 assets, which is better than once, you know, one, as you said, right? If I, I'd rather have a, you know, 10 loans than one loan, but, but at the same time, they, this is, this is on their minds. It's on us as investors. When we put our investor hat on and say, Hey, I worked hard. I made money. I want to invest it. We, it. It's just like, it's, I don't know if it's just been beat into us as Westerners or whatever, but diversification is just on top of mind. Like don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like it's just sort of, right. it's like a universal a thing that everyone's, you know, it's, uh, any reasonable adult tends to f- kind of figure out, right? And so that's an issue, right? Because for them, they're going, well, I am only worth a million or a million and a half. That's my net worth. I'm going to put a tenth of my net worth into you, you just one one sponsor who's buying deals in Austin, Texas. You know, seems a seems a bit, you know, that's that's not a diversified portfolio. You're sort of overweighted, right? right? Um, well, the you know the the other thing that I that I, I've seen too, Lance, is that um, is suitability, right? And and you know I remember we had one client that was brought to us, and um, you know this the, this client had been at another uh, advisory firm, and they were they were uh, their their new advisor, you know, said, hey, I, I need some help with this client, and they showed me this client's portfolio, and this person's alternative exposure that their previous advisor had gotten them to do was basically to buy like five life insurance policies off a marketplace. Like that was it. And I about fell out of my chair because I said, you know, gosh, does this person really understand all the risks involved? You know, do they, they, you know, have they thought about paying the premiums here? Have they thought about reserving for this? You know, well, do they know when the maturity dates are, you know, and all these questions that go through yeah. my mind when I do our own due diligence and our own investing. And, you know, I said, they said, this person is, is holding something that may be either a dud or maybe a bomb and you don't know which one it is. Um, so why don't we help her? Why don't we help this person by selling out, you know, let, let's liquidate that, turn it into cash and then put them into a, a diversified portfolio that has a much better chance of giving a very consistent return. Um, and that's what we did. And, and I see that from time to time. I, I, I see, you know, I see folks investing in things that just are really not suitable yeah. for an individual. Um, you know, I think on the on the real estate side, I, I think you, you see a lot of people who like to, you know, in, who, they get their toe into it by investing kind of deal by deal, right? Yeah. You know, they hear about a deal that their friends are doing. Uh, you know, their brother-in-law brings them, you know, a deal. You know, hey, we're, you know, raising money for this apartment complex, this multifamily, whatever. And, you know, they say, well, yeah, all right, cool. That looks great. That sounds great. I've read the, I've read the, the brochure. I'm all in. And, you know, they put their money into it and then they don't realize, like, hey, your, your time to get paid out on this thing is like seven years. Are, are, you know, are you able to withstand cash not coming out for that long or only a minor amount? You know, if the answer is no or if the answer is question mark, then that wasn't a suitable product for you. Right. Yeah. So that's the other thing we've tried to solve for, too, is is by building out a diversified asset base. You know, we're, we're giving something to that client that's a lot more suitable for them, you know, at the right size, you know, at the ability to generate, you know, the targeting to generate very consistent returns. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's and, and it. 
it, it's funny as we have this conversation, it, it, it seems as though this should just be somewhat ubiquitous. Like, of course, this should exist and I should, you know, this makes perfect sense. There must be plenty of things I could invest in that meet this criteria. The answer is no, there is not, right? That, that you know, so it, 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 what you and I are talking about, what, in you, what you guys have built is, I mean, I won't go as far as saying it's unique. It's unique, of course, in its own construction, but it, it's certainly, there's not a lot of people who've built portfolios that look like that. And I believe that you guys have sort of taken, you know, you, you've built sort of a portfolio that is diversified in many ways across these different um, asset classes. And um, while also, um, but it, it leans more toward income producing, right? right. But like, and I think and, that's yeah, another thing you need to realize, traded. like, yeah, income or growth. I mean, I know income and growth together sounds awesome, but it, it's harder to build. Like, and I know it's like fun to say out loud, like I've invested in something that's income and growth, right? Like I've killed in two birds with one stone, maybe. Um, right. But but I always I always challenge people, especially when I'm trying to help people architect these sorts of investment vehicles. Like, I keep. But what what's the primary problem it's solving? Is is this is are we solving income? How about risk aversion? Who you know the person you know what's their risk aversion? You know, do they have very low risk tolerance or are they, you know, more risk tolerance? Once again, are they younger? Are they older? Are they 80? Are they 60? Um, you know, that's how you have to put these things together. You kind of have to pick a lane. And so for you guys, you said, well, more, right, like more income and probably medium risk, not like you're not trying to kill it. You're saying, how can we get consistent income first and foremost? The, the growth piece, I think, is in your mind, sort of right. secondary, right? Our, our focus really is on income generation and capital preservation, you know, and that's kind of the core in there. The other, the other piece, too, is, you know, we, we, don't, we don't deal with anything that's publicly traded. So we don't have any publicly traded stocks. We don't have any publicly traded bonds. Uh, we, we avoid that sort of stuff. There's plenty of advisors out there that if, if you want that stuff, you can go find it anywhere, right? Um, and, the, you know, the benefit is that you know, I look at our client base, which is, you know, mostly folks who are, you know, they're they're at or near retirement. You know, it's usually a married couple. And I think about them and, you know, they lived through an 08, right? They lived through, in some cases, they lived through an 01 and 02, right? And they saw what happens when you get, you know, these extreme fluctuations in the market and what that does to the nest egg, right? You know, if, I, if I've got a client who's, yeah. you know, 65, you know, so that means he was in his, you know, in his, in his early 50s when, when 08 happened. Um, you know, he's going to he, he saw what happened as he's thinking about retirement. He's looking at his 401k statement and he saw what happened with that extreme market volatility. And now that he's yeah, now that he's older, you know, he, he or she's older. Yeah, they got no appetite for it. And I don't blame him. You know, even, well, even though the market has has done great, you know, this last year, you know, just even though it's it's you know, even though it, it tends to, to do well. You just don't have the stomach for that that drop, and and I don't blame them. Um, yeah, it's vol you know. the volatility. Once again, you can't. I mean, I think, like you said, yeah. it's like you're approaching retirement age. That's where income's so important. And I think that the mark. I think that you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that that whole fixed income play has always been difficult for most to solve for, right? Like right. because I mean, I think a lot of times because the instruments have been, ex you know, public exposure. So they're, they're basically, they've got the volatility to deal with. So what they thought was sort of this fixed income replacement, all of a sudden the market goes, it, it, it goes up and down on them. And it's like, okay, this is no good. It's not, it's not solving the problem. And I think that that's where when you have non-correlation to the public markets, um, that's how you can, you know, get some of that volatility out of it. Um, you know, but of course you, you give up some liquidity, right? And, and right. you know, so it's, yes, it's not as liquid, but that's, they go sort of hand in hand. If you want less volatility, it sort of inherently means that it's less liquid. That's what helps make it less volatile. So, for, I mean, the, those are the things though. Now the, the shame, and, and this is what I mean, going to the democratization, that's the hard part, right? Is that your average, your average, uh, um, person, th th there aren't that many, products in the market that if you're not accredited that can kind of give you that which is kind of terrifying right that, that it is difficult because when you're retired that means that you don't have a job anymore that means that you like something a little bit more than the social security and, and maybe you had a pension from someplace else or whatever but now, you know those days are beyond, they're behind us 
Mm -hmm. I mean, most of these people now, it's up to everybody to do it. But the, the, the availability of products in the market to solve the fundamental problem of how can I get checks or you know deposits in my bank account, you know, monthly or quarterly, so that I can like pay for you know us to live. You know, like right. it's it's hard to find, right? Yeah, it, it, it's difficult, and um, you know, and that's one of the things that I that. That, that may be my next project, my next career, is, is figure out how I can take what we're doing, you know, for accredited investors and see how I can, I can move it down even further on the ladder. Because, um, you know, you're right. If, if, you, if you're below that accredited investor level, it's, it's tough to find uh, something that's not publicly traded, you know, and subject to that market volatility that will give you kind of that dependable income. I mean, in, and I'm not sure there's a good solution for that quite yet. No, I don't. I don't think there is, right? Because I think that, I mean, once first of all, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to be big enough to go and and become an investment company, right? So you're gonna have to deal with that. So that just right there, sort of, is gonna the cost and expense and the the burden of that is big, and and then just finding enough product. Because I think don't you guys run into that too? I mean, like a lot of times, it's just like you might vet a sponsor or you know an opportunity, but. A lot of times it's just the, the availability or the access to even get into some of those deals. Like they don't even have the ability to take down lots of capital. I mean, you take like – I mean I've heard in the litigation finance and stuff like that. So it's just hard to find that product. Like it, it life settlements even. I mean there's just not that much of it out there. I mean there's not enough enough of it unlike real estate where real estate's everywhere, um, <laughs> right? And so sometimes it's just hard to even get into those deals because they just don't have enough um, supply. Well, it can be it can be a balancing act, and you know, and that's that's one of the good that's one of our value add pieces because we we deal with you know so many different assets and and so many different allocations. We're able to manage you know a lot of that. What 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 I think a lot of individual investors have trouble with is uh, you know especially if you're if you're kind of on that smaller end is is if you have to be subject to capital calls, right? Um, you know, it's it's really tough to sit there and, and make a you know a half million dollar commitment yeah. or something to a real estate deal. And then see that get called over the course of two, three, four years, something like that, right? Um, you know that can be difficult to plan for cash wise, and and you know that's that's sort of the benefit of 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 our program. That cap call effect gets muted out, and because we're managing that cash that's that's flowing through the portfolio. Yeah, exactly. We and that's sort of what we hit on to back in 2012, Matt and I, when we. I mean, we, we intuitively knew that what investors would want would be some diversification and the ability to have a redemption right. So the ability and, and not to have to deal with the capital calls, right, which is the most close, close-ended vehicle sort of, as you said, you know, you're going to have to be ready to come up with money in two weeks notice over a two-year period or whatever. You know, but it, it's like the complexity goes up like a hundredfold. I mean, as you know, you know, managing in a, uh, a vehicle with that, it's just it, it is more complex um, to kind of deal with. But but ultimately, that is where you you get some amount of liquidity. If I put money in today, I can make sure I can just wire you the totality of it. Your job is to manage the portfolio, exactly. put it to work. And and then ultimately the ability if if I if I do need it to have you know a lockup period but the ability to re, to redeem in you know two or three years instead of having to stick around for the totality of the you know of, of the investments under the underlying investments going full cycle to the very end um, so it's just these are all the, the the issues that you kind of have to deal with that's why I'm always so adamant with people like you've got to decide what the, prob- the main problem is that you're trying to solve. Like in your case, it's like, okay, if you're trying to solve for income and you're trying to solve for diversification across asset classes, you know, you, you kind of have to pick some lanes and it just inherently there's going to be things that you have to give up. Um, you know, it sort of just kind of forces you to, to have to go that route. When you try to be all things, all people, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work in this space. And, um, cause a lot of people do, I mean, I mean, I think yours is maybe maybe a little bit easier to overcome, but I think a lot of people with just the fund to fund sort of structures, they they kind of get a bad rap, and it it annoys me because I kind of I guess I'm defensive because I come from that. I see the value in it, right? Is that I think it's just not it's not fully appreciated that that having someone be able to construct and build a portfolio that gives you diversification. I think that everyone loves to talk about it, but they don't fully appreciate how how valuable it is. And then they're very quick to sort of say, well, you're just a middleman in there just scraping another set of fees. And I'm going, well, if that bothered you so much, 
then you wouldn't you wouldn't be transacting with hardly anybody in the world because I think there's far more middlemen and middlemen's middlemen that have been scraping your stuff for years that you're just not well, privy to. <laughs> you know well, what I mean? I, mean? Like, I think you know the point to maybe to maybe kind of expand on there really is that you, diversification has to be thoughtful, right? You can't just take a shotgun approach and just you know buy a little bit of everything and then you know hope it all works out, right? Um, you know, one of the things, you know, that we focus on is, okay, we want to be diversified, but we want to make sure that we're, we have some tilts in on that diversification. So for instance, on the real estate side, right? Um, I'm interested in, in, in real estate loans in kind of the, the urban areas or the U S sunbelt, you know, the, the areas that are growing consistent, um, that are, that, are, you know, there's, they have uh, good employment numbers. They've got good population numbers, demographic numbers, right? I'm not interested necessarily in the super hot areas like Austin, you know, where, where our real estate market is just exploding and is, is, is gone nuclear. Um, I'm not interested in, in, yeah. in those super hot areas um, because, you know, there's a lot of risk in there. There's a lot of risk just on the way up and there's a lot of risk when the bottom falls out all of a sudden, um, as, as we've even seen happen here in Austin a few times. So, you know, you, you want to be diversified, yes. But there's a point where you can be over diversified. And so that's part of what our value add is, is to make sure we're thoughtfully diversified. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I earlier today I was looking at, at an investment uh, with uh, small business loans that were kind of spread across uh, emerging markets across the globe, you know, in Africa and in and, and Europe and in or sorry, uh, some parts of Eastern Europe and mm. parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And, you know, the thought kind of occurred to me. I was like, you know, this is cool. But do I really need to kind of layer on some of these additional risks in the emerging market? Is that over diversification, right? And that's that's yeah. the kind of stuff that occupies our time. We got to be thoughtful about how we build that diverse portfolio, and we've got to make sure that you know we do stack the deck in our investors' favor when it comes to building that diversification in. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it is. It's sort of that guardrail to guardrail. You know, invest in you know, 250 grand into a single asset multifamily syndication because it's got a, you know, pro forma projections of 3x and, you know, whatever, or taking the same, you know, 250 and investing, you know, doing 500, $500 <laughs> investments in a bunch of different things. You know, it's sort of like, that is that yeah. I like the word thoughtful, right? Because it, cause it is. And, and that's why I say it's just, it's, it's always about if you're being thoughtful, that means that you're thinking through how do I what what a value am I bringing? Right. You know, how do I bring value to the people in this case, investors? Right. It's my job to be thoughtful about how we build and construct the portfolio. Right. Not to just, you know, just go invest in the small business loans, you know, that in emerge, you know, across the globe or whatever, just just to do it. So we can say we've got this and this and this and that. Um, but to say, OK, well, what? Once again, what what are we trying to solve for? What are we trying to what what is that? And treating and I think you of course have done a great job of that because where your your background is. But it's just it is a no matter what these are net every time a, an offering is brought to the market in the public market or in the private markets, it, it's it's a net new investment product, right? Like mm -hmm. that's what it is. And I think those who put them together and are executing whatever their strategy is, whether it's you know, uh, portfolio construction or capital allocation like you guys do, or you're an operator who repositions multifamily properties, right? It's that it's just understanding that, 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 that you, the people that put money into it, it's part of their larger portfolio and being thoughtful about that. You know, a lot of real estate guys, they, they love to talk about the power of depreciation, but, but a lot of times they don't, they don't do the things in how they they construct those offerings to maximize the benefit at times. Simple things like, um, okay, yeah, we're willing to take you know uh, non taxable you know accounts you know IRA money into our deals. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I think you know once again you have got to think that through. But okay, so you're going to do it. So you've decided to do it. You're going to take money from those sorts of people. Well, then and then you don't sort of say, oh, I'd love to talk about depreciation, but then you don't talk about well, maybe you should just set up the partnership so that depreciation doesn't get allocated to the to, yeah, to the, the non-taxable right. people. And that's why they can't use it, right? There's it's no good to them, right? So it's just those are the sorts of things I think that get overlooked. And I do think that's why a lot of people in the space, 
you know, because it's all about this capital raising and, and, and those sorts of things. And I think my big frustration is that most of the participants aren't being thoughtful about what it is that they're doing and how it really benefits. They're doing, they want the money because it allows them to go do what they want to do, which is buy more real estate or fund more loans instead of thinking, well, how does this benefit my investor? Yeah, I, I, I get it that you're going to generate some kind of return, but is it, have you thought through the risks that those people are taking and is it aligned and, you know, all, all of those sorts of things, which is what you guys do all day long. Cause you're on the other side of the table, right? Talking to sponsors like, Hey, you might like some guy's strategy, but if their structure's all weird and messed up and one-sided, you know, you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, nice knowing you, right? You're, right. you're, you're exactly. going to pass. Yeah. It, it, it has to be the right fit for, for sure. Um, you know, and, 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 and kind of, you know, going back to our, our, our two main, you know, our two main philosophies, generating income and capital preservation. Um, you, you know, I, I was, as, as I was kind of preparing my notes for this today, one of the things I thought about uh, was, was giving some real world examples of that and, and how, how we've helped, def- how the diversified portfolio helps to defend, you know, that investor, that end user investor. You know, we had, we had a, yeah. uh, we had a loan, uh, a real estate loan for a property. Uh, it was a multifamily property being developed in Houston. Uh, a few years, a few years ago, when Hurricane Harvey mm-hmm. rolled through, right, and you know, if you remember Hurricane Harvey, you know the levees were filling up. They basically had to just start dumping water so they didn't break. Uh, you know, parts of Houston were under six feet of water, and, and including the the part where this uh, property was, and it was you know had been partially under construction at the time, right? And the uh, you know the borrower on the property, he basically turned the the, the title back over to the to the uh, the lender and said, you know. I, <laughs> I wash my hands of this thing. I, I'm not going to get it done because I'm going to have to yeah. basically pay for it all to be be rebuilt. And um, you know, the the lender took a you know they took about a 20 percent loss on the loan when it was all said and done. You know, getting the property rehabbed and, and sold, right? Because I mean, it was under six feet of water. Um, yeah. You know, and I I looked at that uh, at that one loan and I took the loss from that. You know, which again was a 20 percent loss on that one loan. But when it was boiled up to the top level of our overall portfolio. It was like minus zero point zero 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 one percent loss, right? I mean, a, a, an amount that you wouldn't even that yeah, you wouldn't yeah. even blink at, you wouldn't even notice it was there, right? Um, and that's and that's yeah. part of that power of diversification, right? Um, that's part of that capital preservation. I mean, look, you know, it, when it comes to when it comes to how you invest, uh, I, I think there's a saying about you know you invest in you invest in individual things when you want to get rich. And you invest, you invest in a diversified portfolio when you want to stay rich. And that's what we're focused on, right? Focus on the capital preservation, focused mm-hmm. on that income, and, you know, make sure that, that someone, especially who's at or near retirement, that they have something that, that, that they know is not going to be subject to these wild fluctuations of the public markets. Yeah, most, most definitely. Yeah, I think that that's the and, – and that's where, I mean, the good news is that – it's super early days when it comes to these alternative investments mm-hmm. and the access, right? Like when you think about it, it it's in, and that's a, and it's, it's going to, it's great because I think the access and the exposure and people's understanding, I mean, that's the thing that I've seen, especially through this, this downturn is just, it's like, I, I don't know what happened, just the idleness of, of not, you know, the lack of busyness or whatever is going on. But I mean, in, it's like the, 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 the switch flip for many investors are realize like, Oh my gosh, I need to educate myself. Like I, like the, the people going out and actually saying my financial future is up to me and I need to do something about it. I mean, it just seems like there's a huge groundswell when it comes to, you know, education around finances and, you know, people really, really taking it more seriously now. And, you know, this is a big part of that topic, right? It's just understanding, you know, why, like, like, like the, the example you use with the Houston deal, I mean, I mean, you know darn well that there was a there's, you know, there's probably a syndicated deal. Someone probably had 50 grand in it. The 50 grand probably represented 10 percent of their, you know, of, you know, five or 10 percent of their net worth. Mm-hmm. And that went yeah. away. <laughs> That's like the opposite of capital preservation. Right. By being in first loss position. Yet, you know, the loan hit that was taken and then, like you said, rolled up across the whole portfolio is basically it, it's. It wasn't even a rounding error. I mean, like you couldn't if you didn't went and look at it, you wouldn't even notice that it was there. So it, it's I think that's the good news. This is why I do this podcast. Why I love having guys like you on to talk about it, because this is like this is how people need to approach this. And, and we can't just have it where, 
you know, people are just throwing 50 grand in every deal they see and, and then turning around and going, what have I done? And I think which is what happened to some people is that they invested a bunch of syndications for the cash flow. And then last year, you know, the cash flow stopped because, of course, it was prudent for many of those operators to mm-hmm. hold on to the cash. I mean, um, whereas like, you know, debt funds or whatever that, that, that are, you know, they're still being paid interest. I mean, obviously some people had some issues there, but it's just realizing they're not the same thing. The result might feel the same. It might feel like you're getting a 7% cash on cash return or income return annually, but the 7% in a, in a fund like yours versus, uh, you know, a vehicle like, like, or your program that you guys run versus the, the uh, a syndication, they're, they're two different things entirely, even though it looks like they're the same, one is going to be able to sustain and continue to pay just because of how it's built and constructed. The other is going to just go from that to zero quick, right? right. They're, just, they're just different. And I think that it seems that people, just in my interactions with investors, I don't think that many people have quite connected those dots but yet. The, I, think it's, I think it's just really easy to fall in love with individual investments that you see. Um, you know, especially if, you know, you're, you're, you're hanging out on the golf course and your buddy, you know, tells you about something he's doing and it sounds cool and interesting, you know, and it's, it's yeah. really easy to kind of just get the blinders on and, and, you know, only see kind of that end goal and not see any of the, the, the hazards along the way. Right. Um, and I, and I, and I see it all the time and, 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 um, you know, it, it it's, it, you know, it, it, it's great if it works out. You feel like a genius. You feel like you did everything right. You know, you, you want to go play golf with your buddy again and see what other deals he's up to. Um, but when it doesn't work out, you know, that like you said, that guy with 50 grand, you know, that was 10 percent or 20 percent of his assets to put into this, this the, into alternatives. When that takes a hit, that's meaningful. That hurts. That hurts deep down right there. It hurts deep down. That's right. Cool. All right, Jason, where can people learn more about what you and uh, the whole team over at Fairway Asset sure. Management are up to? How can they, sure. How can well, we got a. You, you can go to our website, fairwayassetmanagement.com. dot com. We uh, we tried to get a longer domain name, but we couldn't. Um, the uh, <laughs> um, you can go there. Uh, uh, you know, we you can see a little bit about us. Um, we uh, uh, you can contact us through through that website as well. We 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 have to keep a couple things kind of behind a little bit of a veil and, until we until we know the the potential investor just due to SEC regulations. So. Take a, take a look at the website. You can see some nice, colorful photos of me. Um, I don't have a beard in that one, so, you know, it's still the same guy. Um, but uh, you can contact us through there and, and love to tell you more about our program. Um, you know, I, I think it's a great fit if if you need that income and you're worried about capital preservation um, and you, you are just tired of volatile, volatile equity markets, uh, then give us, you know, take a look. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks so All much, right. man. Thanks, we'll be in Bye. touch. Bye.